Aye. Frank Rafino for Fiona Ma. Aye. David Miller. Aye. Stacy Oliveris. Aye. Jason Perez. Aye. Ramon Rubacava. Aye. Madam Chair, we have all ayes. Motion made by Henry Jones, seconded by Therese Taylor for the chairperson, David Miller. Great. Thank you, David. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you all. I appreciate the, the support and encouragement. <laughs> so we'll move on to the election of the vice chair. And uh, I'll open the floor for nominations for the vice chair. Uh, Mr. Rubalcava. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman Miller. I'd like to nominate Teresa Taylor for uh, vice chair, please. Thank you. Okay. Second. Seconded by Mr. Jones. Okay. Do we have any further nominations? Any other nominations? And once more, any other nominations? Okay, um, we have a nomination and a second for Ms. Taylor for vice chair. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask Ms. Hopper to call the roll. Henry Jones? Aye. Frank Rafino for Fiona Ma? Aye. David Miller? Aye. Stacy Oliveris? Aye. Jason Perez? Aye. Ramon Rubicava? Aye. Mr. Chair, we have all ayes. Motion made by Ramon Rubicava, seconded by Henry Jones for the vice chair, Teresa Taylor. Okay, the ayes have it. Uh, congratulations, Ms. Taylor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Yeah, Hopper. And uh, we'll move on to Item three, the approval of the February 17th, 2021 Finance and Administration Committee Timed Agenda. Move approval. Second. Moved by Ms. Taylor, seconded by Mr. Jones. Um, any discussion? Call for the question. Ms. Hopper, would you call the roll? Henry Jones? Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Ma? Aye. David Miller? Aye. Stacy Oliveris. Aye. Jason Perez. Aye. Ramon Rubicava. Aye. Mr. Chair, all ayes for the motion being made by Teresa Taylor, seconded by Henry Jones for the approval of the uh, timed agenda for finance and administration. Can I get a vote? Yeah, I just saw that. Teresa Taylor. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, it's unanimous, the ayes have it, uh, the motion is approved. So we'll move on to item four, the executive report. So I'll call on Mr. Michael Cohen. Thanks chair and, uh, and committee members, Michael Cohen with the CalPERS Financial Office. Uh, just two things to highlight for you this morning. Uh, one, I wanted to just give you a brief overview of the governor's budget that was released in January. As many of you know, uh, the state's economy is doing better than forecast when uh, the budget was passed last June. That's largely due to the K-shaped recovery that you, uh, you all talked about yesterday, where the wealthier Californians who pay the majority of California taxes are doing better than, than those lower income Californians. And as a result, the state budget is in considerably uh, better position than uh, everyone thought when the budget was passed last June. So that leads to two very positive results as it relates to CalPERS. First is that the state has planned on making an additional $1.5 billion payment on behalf of the state's CalPERS plans to us in the upcoming fiscal year. And second, the governor has indicated his uh, hope that um, he will be able to negotiate the end to uh, the personal leave program that's been in effect for this year and was due to carry on uh, into the next into the next fiscal year. So um, we're hopeful uh, that will uh, continue 
uh, good news into the May revision, and we'll obviously have an update for you as soon as uh, the May revision is released. Uh, and the second item, if we can uh, elevate uh, Billy Kim from uh, your independent auditor, BDO, uh, to the panel, is just circling back to a public comment we received the last time the board met in November. There was a comment about one of BDO's slides dealing with uh, an adjustment made from our 2019 books. And rather than uh, me explain it, I thought it would be easier to, for you all and the public to hear from the auditor. So uh, with that, if uh, Mr. Chair, with your indulgence, I'll turn it over to uh, Billy Kim from, from BDO. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we understand uh, during the recent Board of Administration meeting, a public comment was raised in relation to the 582.9 million cumulative effect of uncorrected misstatements in investments for real assets and in the fiduciary funds, which was brought forward from 2019 and corrected in the 2020 financial statements as presented by BDO in the fiscal year 2020 audit wrap up presentation to the risk and audit committee this past November. To give some background, CalPERS has routinely uh, recorded its real asset and private equity investment valuations on a quarter lag, meaning that valuations as of March 31 are used in the June 30 CAFR. Now this practice is adopted to ensure that both the books are closed and the CAFR is issued timely as there can be delays in reporting by the underlying real asset and private equity entities to CalPERS. With this said, uh, Calper staff, as well as BDO, as your auditors, each independently perform an analysis yearly prior to issuance of the financial statements to evaluate whether the market change from April to June has a significant effect on the financial statements uh, using information provided from the real asset and private equity investment entities, which is not available until after June 30th. Now, if the impact is assessed to be significant, CalPERS would reopen the accounting records and update the CAFR accordingly. The 582.9 million cumulative effect of uh, uncorrected misstatements brought forward from 2019 and corrected in 2020 financial statements represents only 0.1% of the June 30, 2019 total assets and deferred outflows of the fiduciary funds and about 1% of the fiscal year 2019 total additions. Now this was concluded by management and concurred by BDO not to be significant enough to warrant reopening the books and updating the cap or prior to issuance. However, it was still large enough for BDO as your auditors in accordance with our auditing standards to report to the risk and audit committee of this unadjusted difference in 2019. Since this difference was recorded in fiscal year 2020, when it should have been recorded in 2019, it was reported to you again as part of the fiscal year 2020 audit results. Now in contrast for fiscal year 2020, this type of activity from April to June 2020 for real asset and private equity investments was significantly larger. It was at 1.3 billion and CalPERS staff made a decision to reopen the books and update the CAFR prior to issuance uh, and record the activity in 2020 rather than wait to record in the first quarter of fiscal year 2021. Now, as your auditors, we believe this was not just not only appropriate, but best practice, especially given the size of the movement. Thanks, Billy, for that explanation. Uh, Mr. Chair, that concludes our uh, my executive report, unless uh, there are questions or comments. Yes, sir. We do have a couple questions or comments, and uh, the first one is from Ms. Brown. Thank you. Did you want to take committee members first, or uh, I'm willing to, uh, Ms. Frost is saying yes. Why don't I wait and you take committee member members? Yeah. And okay. Thank you. Then we'll do that. Um, so, President Jones. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Miller. Yeah, Mr. Kim, uh, just a question regarding uh, whether or not there's a uh, best practice or a audit requirement 
for a threshold where restatements have to be made? Or is that um, left to the agency to determine um, on its own uh, when restatements are made? Yes. Uh, well, first off, uh, a restatement has a very specific connotation in, in the auditing and accounting word uh, world. And um, but I, I take your, your your question as to whether there needs to be an adjustment to the financial statements prior to issuance. Uh, so with that respect, you know, it is there's there's judgment involved here. Um, I gave you some certain percentages uh, in terms of the 582.9 million in 2019 as it relates to the 2020 financial statements. And 1% uh, or even anything less than 1% uh, in, our, in, in, the, in our profession is uh, considered to be uh, you know, something that is not material. Uh, but, but again, there is still judgment um, involved in this. And so this is something that uh, is uh, at the discretion of management, uh, but also at the same time uh, you know, something that your auditors uh, and BDO being your auditors would be in discussion with, with management if we have any disagreements uh, uh, as such on that. Thank you. David, are you set? Oh, there it is. Okay. Next, we have Director Rubo Kava. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Miller. My question is regarding the, uh, the state budget report by Mr. Cohen. Um, Mr. Cohen, given the, uh, the good news on the governor's budget, do you think there's any possibility that the, the state will begin to pre-fund the judge's retirement system actuary by, uh, act, sorry, the, the, the first plan, not, not, the, not the two, but the judge's one? which is uh, pay as you go, I was reading the report and it's pay as you go and the other one is very well funded and the other one it's a closed system, so it's overfunded. But I know that right. a letter from the CalPERS to the governor asked that they begin to pre-fund as opposed to pay as you go, which is the best practice. Uh, yeah, it, it certainly is the best practice, but I will tell you that CalPERS has sent that letter uh, for years and years to the governor and legislature and there hasn't been, in my experience, any real discussion about uh, switching over to a pre-funding system. So in recent years, the real emphasis has been building up uh, the uh, overall state pension plans in terms of their funded ratio, as well as focusing on the pre-funding of the retiree health benefits. So I would suspect uh, if past practice is uh, in an indication that we wouldn't see a, a change in practice from the administration on, on that. Appreciate we appreciate your insight. Thank you very much. Thank thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Okay, and uh, we'll come back to Director Brown. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and and my comments are on the um, five hundred eighty-two million dollar um, adjustment to the financials. Um, and uh, first of all, I sit on the risk and audit committee and. Um, this was missed by me, and thank goodness for the speaker who came and uh, brought it to our attention. Um, so this adjustment, Mr. Kim, according to you, is because of the uh, the change in the asset value of real estate assets from for that for or private equity assets. I'm sorry for that quarter, right? It was specifically uh, real assets. Real assets, April, May, and June. April, May, and June, right? And so this this always happens, and you're always going to take a look at this. Like this year, it was 1.3 billion. Yes, we we always look at this just because of the practice that Calpers takes uh, to uh, close their books, and so they utilize March uh, values uh, to uh, estimate the values as a June thirtieth, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, that's in order to close the books and to issue the financial statements on time. It, it, and would we make these same adjustments if there was an increase in the real property values as well? Yes, it, it goes either way. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. 
Right. And then the, the bigger issue I had is that I know uh, in, uh, in finance and accounting, 1% is uh, not necessarily material, but, you know, we're not a $2 billion fund. We're a $400 billion fund. So 1% is a lot of money. And so I would hope that maybe in addition to looking at the percentage threshold that we're also looking at the total uh, dollar amount and making that um, uh, judgment. And then I would assume for now on Mr. Cohen, when we have these big adjustments, you'll certainly point it out to risk and audit and make sure that we understand it so we don't have to really focus on it from a, a speaker's comment. Uh, that'd be helpful. Sure, and just to uh, respond, uh, Board Member Brown, uh, this was highlighted in one of yeah. video slides. So um, we absolutely will make sure that that happens again. But um, this was an item that was presented to the public through uh, the video presentation. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, not seeing any further requests for questions or comments, and so uh, thank you for. The report, Mr. Cohen, and we'll move. Oh, was that a, no, oh, okay, nothing. So and we'll move on to item five, action consent items. Um, and I don't see any requests to pull anything. So approval. move approval by Ms. Taylor, seconded by Mr. Perez. So any further discussion? I'll call for the question. Uh, Ms. Hopper, would you take the roll? Henry Jones? Aye. Frank Rafino for Fiona Ma? Aye. Stacy Oliveris? Aye. Uh, Jason Perez? Aye. Ramon Rubacava? Aye. Teresa Taylor? Aye. Mr. Chair, I have all ayes with a motion made by Teresa Taylor, seconded by Jason Perez for items 5A, 5B, 5C, 5D, and 5E. The ayes have it, the motion passes. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hopper. Move on to item six, information consent items. Uh, what's the pleasure of the committee? Oh, Ms. Brown, moving approval. Is there a second? Oh. I'm not on the committee. I just wanna make sure that 6D gets pulled. Oh, okay, pulling, thank oh, okay. I see it now. Okay, so we'll pull 6C as in cat. Okay, so the motion is, um, so do we have a motion for the remaining items? Um, you need a, a motion for information oh, consent. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's just information. Okay, so then um, we will move on to item 6C, the treasury analysis and liquidity status report. Uh, back to you, Mr. Cohen. Sure, if we could uh, pull, um... Michelle and Melody into the uh, the panelists. Uh, they're uh, from the Treasury Group in the Controller's Office. Uh, but I think, given the board has had a chance to review this, uh, perhaps I would ask uh, Chair, uh, you know, uh, Board Member Brown, if you've got specific questions or if you'd like a, a full presentation. I just have a specific question on the cash flows. Great. Um, uh, so do we need to bring them forward or do you think you can handle this? Uh, we, we will see based on the detail of your question, but uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, start the process of uh, bringing them online? Yeah, and, and Director Brown, once they come online, you'll have the floor. Michelle and Melody should be able to share their audio and their video. Excellent. So I think my my question is fairly simple. I'm looking at um, uh, item 6, the attachment 1, page 2 of 12, where um, we are looking at uh, the cash flow um, 
forecasting. And then I'm really looking at the last chart on that page, which is the actual versus estimated non-investment and investment cash flows. And I, I like how they look, except December 20 for um, the actual uses and the estimated uses, uh, we, it looks like we're off by about $2 billion. I don't know if this, because we only see a snapshot of one year, I don't have a trend. Is this something that normally happens or can you explain sort of uh, why that big miss there? Or maybe I'm Correct. reading it wrong. Or maybe I'm reading it wrong. I don't know. No, that um, that seems like uh, uh, the right way to uh, interpret that chart. Uh, Melody or Michelle, you want to take that one? Um, yeah, could you, Margaret, could you tell us again what page you're looking at, just so we have sure. the right? Sure, question. sure. It's page uh, two of twelve, and it's the cash flow uh, graphs showing the actual versus estimated uses. The very last chart on the bottom of that page. And, you know, as you look across, they're all, uh, you know, pretty close, you know, sources versus uses. But then you look at December 20, uh, of course, we got a lot more revenue in, but our u actual uses compared to our estimated uses was off by, um, I think that's $2 billion. Kind of hard to tell. I'm looking at it on a little screen. But uh, I'm just wondering why we were so far off in December. And is that normal? Because... When we see this chart, we don't we don't have a trend. We don't see a trend line. And so maybe I can ask for that going back a couple of years, what the December, what the December number is or has been. Sure. Um, it, it is normal to have that kind of a fluctuation. I will say that um, this particular um, December activity is just due to investment activities. So there's more opportunities. Uh, that happened in this particular month and uh, that we took advantage of them. It's hard to estimate that. Um, we try, but um, we do our best. But it, in this case, we just, we, we were just off. Is it, it, it no, 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 nothing specific happened in terms of uh, more uses? I mean, nothing, nothing. Because... Melody, you, you, you want to jump in on the detail and see if, if you can, give her a little bit more color on that, please. Um, sure. I know that this that there's volatility that can occur um, because of investment activities. So I, uh, my team's kind of looking into it, but we can get back to them on that one. That'd be helpful. I just, I just want to know, and if this is something that normally happens or if we missed, I mean, it's nice to know why we missed, right? If we underestimated it. So thank you. That was my only question. Sure. Okay, um, seeing no more questions on the information consent items. So we'll move to item seven, action agenda item, the 2021 CalPERS Board of Administration member at large notice of election. And so for that, I will call on Dallas Stone. Welcome, Mr. Stone. Good morning. Um, good morning, members of, of the CalPERS Board, Dallas Stone, CalPERS team member. Um, a quick congratulations to Mr. Miller and Ms. Taylor on your chair and vice chair selections. Um, this is an action item seeking the Finance and Administration Committee's approval to initiate the 2021 member-at-large election for two seats on the CalPERS Board of Administration by adopting the notice of election. Last December, the board declared a finding of emergency and approved the initiation of an emergency regulatory action with the Office of Administrative Law to also allow non-original signatures on nomination petitions as a way to mitigate COVID-19 risks from person-to-person -person contact during signature ga gathering activities for the upcoming election. The emergency regulations were approved by the Office of Administrative Law on January 11, 2021. Changes from the approved emergency regulations are reflected in the notice of election, which is included as attachment one to this item. The notice of election also outlines the election schedule. In previous elections, we have re released the notice of election in late March. Due to the pandemic, we have ex extended the nomination petition period to give potential candidates more time in gathering signatures for this election. If approved, 
we will release the notice of election on March 15th, 2021, which will also start the nomination period. Nomination petitions containing any combination of 250 eligible original or non-original, and when we say non-original, that's defined as meaning either reproduce or scanned copies of the original signatures, will need to be submitted to CalPERS by 5 p.m. on May 13th, 2021. Um, all forms related to nomination requirements will be posted on the CalPERS board election webpage. Interested candidates may also request a copy of the forms directly by contacting the board election office. After approval, the board election team will work with its vendor to print and mail the notice of election to retired members. Active members will receive an electronic notice of election distributed to them uh, by their em employers who will receive it from CalPERS VA circular letter. There's a couple of important dates I wanted to highlight and then I can answer any questions that, that the committee might have. So on March 15th, um, we'll be releasing the notice of election and it'll be um, electronically um, disseminated as well as mailed to our retire eligible retirees. Um, May 13th, uh, the nomination petition, nomination acceptance and ballot designation forms and candidate statements are due to CalPERS by 5 p.m. On August 27th, uh, ballots will be mailed directly to eligible voters. Eligible Eligible voters will have the opportunity to submit their vote either online, by telephone, or by paper in accordance with the instructions provided in the ballot package. And our eligible voters will have until September 27th, and that's when all voted ballots must be received uh, by CalPERS on or before this date. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any at this time. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Stone. I do have a question from Director Oliveras. Much. Um, Mr. Stone, I had a question about B, uh, I'm sorry, about A, the nomination petition form. So I see that the last four digits of the social security number to be verified by CalPERS, will the last four digits of a candidate's social security be on the signed petition form? Yes, it will. I'm concerned that poses a risk to identity theft. This is something that we're um, internally discussing with CalPERS. It just, it, 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 the, the, the mandate that the, the last four of those social is in our regulations. We, we again, this is something that we're, we're talking about internally um, and we're looking at, um, at other options to collect identifying information um, in order to um, do the, our, our internal validation processes in order to complete the nomination petition process. Uh, we're looking at things as, as maybe an, an internal electronic nomination petition format behind the member self-service pen with our IT department. Um, but again, not only will we have to build this internally with our IT team, but we'll, uh, we'll also need to pursue regulation changes. And we just did not have enough time within this, within this election period in order to do that, Ms. Oliveris. I would like to suggest that we pursue a bifurcated process by which CalPERS can do validation or verification of the candidate's identity and receive those four digits from the candidate, um, but that the candidate does not have to put their last four digits on the nomination form that is signed. I don't see any reason for signatories to have to review the last four digits of somebody's social security information. I think that's something that we can discuss with, with our legal team. Again, it is in our regulation um, it, and it is part of the regulation that, that defines what that nomination petition is. So it's just a matter of if we would be allowed to do that. Ms. Oliveris, let me maybe weigh in as well. This is, and this goes back to some, some point in time that Dallas mentioned in the in current regs. This is also consistent with the Secretary of State. They actually request that same information. So I'm pretty sure when that was originally developed many years ago, that was sort of modeled on that requirement. Um, we are looking at it internally, um, but again, the regulatory process will take at least a year, um, which by time we will still be in another election process, so. Just out of curiosity, what if someone doesn't have a social security number? That, that, uh... I don't really have an answer to that Are question. Are they then ineligible? Elders. What if they just have a taxpayer ID number? I, 
Uh, I've never been posed that question before, Miss Oliver, so I'm not I'm, I'm I'm not sure, but I could I'm happy to work with our our, our legal team and and be able to respond back with an answer. For I just you think on it's that. an additional consideration as we go through this process. Um, but I just want to say I am very concerned about the risk of identity theft here because its name, its employer information, its address, and the last four digits of the social security number. I, we, we hear you. It's actually, when I looked at the Secretary of State's website to register the vote, it's actually, we're asking for less information that the state does when you go to register originally. So I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying it's what was in existence at the time and currently is in yeah. part of our regulatory process. So without that one year period for the regulatory change and any other modifications, plus the budgetary item that Dallas spoke to from an internal build to have that done in our electronic system, we'd have to bring that back for additional consideration. I understand these things take time and I've been through the emergency reg process and it's not quick, but thank you very much. Okay, next it looks like uh, I have uh, Mr. Rubakava. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair Miller. I had a, um, a question on the uh, the schedule. Uh, on the very bottom talks about the sitting of the board member elect. It says the effective date will be January 16th, 2022. I don't know if that's regulations or what, but that's a Sunday. Does that matter according to the regulations? Just gotta ask. <laughs> no, sir, we just know that the, the current um, board, uh, Mr. Miller and um, Mrs. Brown's um, current um, board election, or I'm sorry, um, um, their, their term ends on January 15, 2022. So this would be the official start date of the, the new term for the, for the two um, candidates that, that win the election. So it doesn't matter that it's a Sunday, then it just not. Okay, thank you. No, sir. Okay, uh, next, uh, Ms. Taylor. Yes, thank you. Uh, Stacy. good question, because I think everybody has to sign, everybody that signs the form also has to put their last four, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the um, change notice of election. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second from, who was that? Oh, Mr. Jones. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, I'll call for the question and ask Ms. Hopper to please take the roll. Henry Jones. Aye. Frank Rafino for Fiona Ma. Aye. Stacy Oliveras. Aye. Jason Perez. Aye. Ramon Rubicava. Aye. Teresa Taylor. Aye. Mr. Chair, I have a motion made by Teresa Taylor, seconded by Henry Jones for item 7A with all eyes. Okay, the ayes have it, the motion passes, and uh, we'll move on to item eight, the information agenda items, and uh, 8A, Pension Contracts Management Program Report. Uh, Mr. Cohen, would you like to introduce our presenters? Certainly, uh, this is a quarterly information report, but we did want to uh, highlight uh, in, it, uh, in particular some changes we're making to the termination process. Uh, let me turn it over to uh, Andy Nguyen uh, in the pension contract division uh, to walk you through uh, the, the slides. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and member of the committee. My name is Andy Nguyen, CalPERS team member. I'm here this morning to present information item 8A, the Pension Contract Management Program Quarterly Report. Slide two, please. The collection activity report provides a summary of collection activity during the second quarter of fiscal year 2021 and provides a snapshot of outstanding cases to January 31st, 2021. Of the 27 outstanding cases, that present during the last quarter, seven were resolved and 20 remain outstanding, totally over $500,000. We are actively working with the employers to resolve these delinquent cases and think they are solvable. Slide three, please. Pension contract is currently managed four ongoing payment plans. 
three for termination costs and one for annual UAL payments. We receive good faith payments from Central Sierra Planning Council and SATA LAFCO, totaling $200,000. All payment plans are current. Lastly, we are working with the with San Luis, San Luis Obispo Regional Transit Authority to resolve the remaining termination payments. Slide four, please. There are two active termination cases, but these are hold over from the first quarter and were reported last quarter. There were no new termination requests during the second quarter. Slide five, please. In 2020, three employers experienced a significant increase in their final termination costs compared to their preliminary estimated costs, mainly due to the bond market volatility. In response, a cost divisional working group reassessed the termination process and implement improvement for new termination cases going forward. Our goal for employers considering or entering termination is to provide as much information as possible to inform their decisions, whichever direction they go, and make the process as smooth as we can. This slide summarizes changes made to the termination process. We, we will increase cost program education to employer regarding termination costs and process. We will provide a broader range of termination cost estimate to the employer in the employer preliminary evaluation report. We will accelerate the completion of the data verification process and the evaluation report. And lastly, we will engage earlier with employer on negotiating how they will pay for the termination costs before the contract is terminated. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you for that presentation. And I do have a question from President Jones. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Miller. Yeah, and thank uh, the team for the improvement in this uh, termination process because we uh, looked at this a couple of years ago and it was taking too long to resolve these cases. So I really want to applaud uh, the team for the steps you've taken to, to improve the process. I do have a question on slide three of your three of five, where it talks about the payment terms where five, seven, pending two year designation there. My question is, what is the maximum length of time that we would uh, allow for them to uh, make these payments before we take some kind of more drastic action? Uh, so when, when we're working with the employer uh, negotiating for the, how they want to pay for the ter termination costs, we tip, if they're asking for a payment plan, we typically uh, negotiate for uh, either three or five years. Um, it's all depend on, um, we review their financial situation, their financial position to see if it's, uh, you know, if it's, is that affordable for them to uh, enter into a payment plan agreement for three or five years. So does that mean they can go beyond the seven years as you listed here? Uh, for for SATA LAFCO case is a, 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 a special case. Um, and the, the circumstance for that one was because the final cost increased drastically over 30%. And um, when we first uh, working with them, they has already worked with, with their board and agreed to pay based on the estimated cost over a five years period. Uh, but when since the cost went up significantly, uh, they asked if they can extend that to a seven years. Um, so we, we assessed their uh, financial situation and they were to, uh, and, um, we were to agree to um, uh, let them pay this off over seven years. So there's no maximum is, Am I hearing you correctly? Um, it's, uh, they, we, we do have maximum, but we you typically working with our actual office to ensure that um, whatever the payment term is, is not longer than what it, whatever the uh, future expected lies for the remaining of the members. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any further requests 
questions or comments. And I just want to thank um, our presenters and the teams that put together the presentations. Uh, you know, nice, concise, clear presentations and responsive to our questions and appreciate all the work that went into them. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, 8B, summary of committee direction, Mr. Cohen. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I do have uh, two items of follow up. Uh, first, uh, in relation to the uh, liquidity report on uh, the page two, the bottom chart, just a follow up in terms of uh, December uh, 20, and we'll also pull together the last couple of years of, of charts uh, for the committee and the board. And then finally, on the election social security number uh, conversation. Uh, we're continuing to work on that issue, but we will give you an answer regarding uh, CalPERS uh, voter who does not have a social security number, how uh, that gets handled. And I think unless I miss something, those are the two items. Okay, yep, looks, looks like uh, we have agreement on that. And so I will move to 8C public comment. I'll call on staff, Mr. Fox, uh, or or Cherie, do we have any public commenters queued up? David, Mr. Chair, this is Kelly Fox. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Fox. Yes, uh, just as Cherie indicated, there are no callers as yet. Thank you. Okay, so we have no public comment. So um, at this point, hearing no objections, I will call to adjourn the meeting. Okay, we are adjourned and I think we were, we'll be coming back at um, what time? 10 o'clock for Perf and Comp. 10 o'clock for Perf and Comp. It's 9.43 by my clock, so we'll see you all in a little less than 15 minutes. Thank Thanks. you.